There we go, that's confirmed that. Um, so again, welcome everyone. So Yves, Professor Yves Gendron, he's a professor in accounting at University Laval at Quebec City. And it's a pleasure to have him today. He's highly committed when it comes to qualitative research, especially in accounting. And his work encompasses several facets of accounting to include um, work that deepens our understanding of the day-to-day -day lives of public accountants and corporate governance um, elements as well of processes within public uh, companies. He's published in a variety of high quality journals and he is co-editor of the Critical Perspectives on Accounting Journal, and is also Associate Editor at the Contemporary Accounting Research Journal. So over to you, Ease. I don't want to take over and talk too much, but I'll allow you now to deliver your presentation on the superficialization of policymaking in the aftermath of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this nice introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, in a way, the invitation uh, from Sarah forced me to uh, develop a series of slides on uh, a tentative idea I had in mind uh, since about uh, one year after the beginning of COVID. Uh, in a way, this is a risky presentation uh, because typically uh, I prefer to have a text in order to uh, support my thinking because writing helps to refine thoughts. Uh, all I have is a series of slides today, uh, but hopefully uh, the ideas I will present will be okay, be appropriate, uh, and they will help to, uh, when I have time in a few years, I hope uh, they will help me to write a book uh, on the superficialization of society. One of the book chapters being what I will present to you today. Okay, so let me allow you, allow me to uh, share my screen. Okay, let's try this one. Okay. Yes, we can see that, Eves. That's great. Okay, this is good. Let me make sure that I'm able to change slides. Okay, great. Okay, so again, all this is very tentative. Uh, all I have is a kind of plan in my head regarding. Uh, one way to make sense of the COVID-19 crisis from a critical perspective. Uh, so this is the outline. I have too many slides, by the way. I think I have 84 slides. So slides, I don't, I will not have time to go through all of them, uh, but I will try to focus on the main ones, ensuring that you have a good idea of the thread uh, regarding my argument. Okay, so summary, which is relatively different from uh, what you read on the announcement of this presentation, because typically when I write, when I develop slides, well, the, the focus changes. So my presentation uh, relates to how media discourse during the COVID-19 pandemic both reflected and helped to diffuse conduits of superficialization in society. I define superficialization as the process through which reflexivity, either individual or collective reflexivity, is gradually constrained, reduced, and numbed. Specifically, I aim to document how thoughts expressed in the media on the pandemic were often not inclined to question the ascendancy of neoliberal policymaking in the healthcare domain. 
So basically what I want to highlight is uh, an endurance process. How could it be that neoliberal policy making regarding healthcare endure in spite of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, which should have translated into uh, concerns, deep concerns, continuous concerns expressed about how we manage healthcare. Uh, but these thoughts, criticisms were not, were quite superficial, I would say. Uh, so this is what we will try to uh, investigate. Uh, my focus will be on the COVID-19 dynamics that took place in Quebec. Uh, so this is from a North American perspective. I think what happened here relates to some extent to uh, the experiences in other countries, uh, for instance, in the UK, uh, but there could be differences. Uh, so keep this in mind. So I don't aim to produce an argument that generalizes over the world. This is not the intent. The intent is to develop an in-depth uh, investigation of a dynamics that took place in Quebec. Uh, so the starting point for my argument is a point which is quite established in the literature. It, it relates to the endurance of neoliberalism to survive crisis. Uh, in the past, uh, there have been several important crises uh, in terms of the political economy, uh, where the way in which the political economy is governed through mostly through neoliberalism, uh, these ways of doing were not seriously challenged by the ways in which people and collectives problematized the crisis. Uh, so it's quite established in the literature. So I provide here, there are lots of several key references to substantiate this idea. Uh, this paper, which I wrote with two colleagues, uh, highlights the same process going on in terms of the, the, the Greek crisis. Uh, where basically we investigated the extent to which neoliberalism endured in spite of uh, the crisis. So I'm skipping this. Uh, just to highlight that this point about the endurance of neoliberalism applies quite well in carbon markets regarding the carbon market idea. Uh, so to see that environ environmentalist uh, basically accept the idea that uh, the fate of the planet would depend on the efficiency, efficiency of uh, carbon markets is an intriguing idea. It took me 50 seconds, uh, 15 seconds to find uh, an example of uh, an environment, environmentalist foundation, so the David Suzuki Foundation, that basically says that carbon markets, carbon taxes, sorry, carbon cap and trade programs could be very effective if they are designed appropriately. Uh, so this is an indication of this is a point, this is an indication of a point of view that contributes to uh, reproduce neoliberal thinking. 
Okay, now, what about the COVID-19 crisis? Two questions uh, are at the center of my investigative, investigative journey. So first question, to what extent has the COVID-19 crisis had a significant impact on the overarching influence of neoliberalism in policymaking? So to what extent did neoliberalism endure in spite of the crisis? Okay, so here the answer, as you will see, is we have serious indications that the answer is to a great extent. Uh, so capitalism, neoliberalism was able to even consolidate its influence on policymaking. Uh, the second question, which is more interesting, uh, how did it occur? How did neoliberalism reproduce in the policymaking idea in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis? Okay, so these are the two questions that basically uh, structure uh, my thinking. Now, let us try to adopt some uh, basic ideas uh, regarding, uh, let, us, let us try to adopt a template to make sense, to help make a sense of uh, the ways in which neoliberalism endures in spite of crisis. So my theoretical point is that the notion of superficialization helps us to understand the enduring influence of neoliberalism in the policymaking idea in the aftermath of COVID. So this is a theoretical point, and in order to elaborate on it, I need first to uh, define what I mean by neoliberalism, and then develop the notion of superficialization and then develop a relationship between the two. Uh, I'm not, I did not think about this naturally. Uh, several theorists uh, helped me in the process. So what is neoliberalism? I'm not going to elaborate on that because I think that the particular that this audience is already quite aware of what this is. So let me skip these slides. I will just highlight this one. Okay, so neoliberalism can be viewed as a political economic agenda that aims to extend the logic of markets to many areas of society. This, this is achieved through three processes. First, deregulation. Second, privatization of public services. And finally, new public management. So the latter one is important because once a government has privatized, deregulated, there are still some activities to manage within a neoliberal government. And this is done through new public management. I assume that this specific audience is aware of what NPM is. Okay, so to make sense of the endurance of neoliberalism to survive crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, I mobilize the notion of superficialization. So how could I define it? Okay, so this is my definition. So superficialization is defined as the process to which individual and or collective reflexivity is gradually constrained, reduced, and numbed. Okay, so I relate superficialization to uh, the minds of people and the minds of collectives. Okay, and importantly, individual and collective reflexivity can be viewed as the key target of channels of superficialization. So let me elaborate a little 
on these tentative theoretical ideas. Okay, so this is an important slide as well as the next one. So if you want to uh, be able to follow what's going to take place empirically, uh, we need to focus on slide 19 and 20. So one key question, what is individual or collective reflexivity? So reflexivity, substantive reflectivity is the opposite of superficial thinking. Okay, so reflexivity is defined as an individual, a collective ability to think in a substantive way. It is characterized with an inclination to think deeply and holistically. An inclination to ponder on means and ends. An inclination to be skeptical of claims made by apparently credible institutions. An inclination to have an autonomous mind. And finally, an inclination to persevere in questioning and in taking action when important challenges have been raised against influential institutions. Okay, so this is how I view substantive reflexivity, so the, the main features, and these features will be palpable, or we will be able to see indications of these features when looking at newspaper articles. Okay, so let, it, let us keep in mind for now. Now, what about the opposite? What is a constraint reflexivity? Or what is superficial thinking? So I would argue that it is characterized by a tendency to think narrowly and technically in accordance with established protocols, which are not questioned. A tendency to think from a short-term perspective, tendency to focus on means without questioning ends, a tendency to accept claims made by apparently credible institutions, and finally, a tendency to show ephemeral interest toward questions and challenges raised against influential institutions. So again, these features of superficial thinking will be palpable when looking at newspaper articles on that aim to make sense of the COVID-19 crisis. Okay, so I was talking about individual collective thinking. Uh, I think the two relate to one another. So superficial thinking could relate to a single individual or to a collective of individuals as a collective is made up of a network of individuals. Okay, channels of superficialization. Uh, when I will write this book chapter, I will see if I keep it or not. Uh, it's unsure at the present time. Uh, but the point is that superficial thinking, wh where does it come from? What are, what are the sources that influence uh, superficial thinking? Uh, so I would argue that the channel of superficialization is a kind of dispositive of discourses, technologies, and practices that seeks gradually to constrain people's reflexivity. These discourses, these practices, these technologies are conveyed uh, through one's colleagues, through family members, the media, and so on. And the overarching aim is to produce superficial minds. Okay, so this is a tentative illustration of uh, the theoretical template I want to rely on in order to analyze uh, 
my empirical material. Uh, so we have here those this this dispositive these channels of superficialization, which exert influence on individual reflexivity. They basically these channels of superficialization want to transform the mind of an individual from a reflexive individual, an individual who is able to engage in uh, substantive thinking to a superficial, a superficial mind. The mind of this individual, when uh, this individual acts in society, well, he or she is able to exert indirectly or directly uh, influence on those channels as well, hence these other arrows here. If we apply this to a collective perspective, then we come with this illustration. The main difference is that now I have represented a collective of individuals. Uh, the aim of those channels of superficialization is to transform those substantive thinking individuals to individuals who think superficially. Okay, so one central stake is the extent to which individual and collective minds are influenced by channels of superficialization. I would argue that superficial collectives tend to think technically from a short-term perspective, that they are unlikely to be highly creative. They tend to be docile vis-a-vis -vis established authorities. And they tend as well to be quite ephem ephemeral regarding the interest they have over ongoing or developing situations. Okay, now let us try to relate uh, COVID-19 dynamics to this idea of superficial, superficialization. And I try to do it through a question. Okay, so this is what I wrote here in blue. So could superficial thought play an instrumental role in the aftermath of COVID-19? in the perennity of neoliberal policymaking structures. This will be our empirical challenge. So again, could superficial thinking play an instrumental role in the endurance of neoliberal policymaking structures? Okay, so we are done with theory, now methodological orientations. So empirically speaking, the aim is to reach for plausibility in the context of examining some parts of a highly complex phenomenon, focusing on the Quebec jurisdiction. So to reach for plausibility. What I want to do, I don't want to write an academic essay uh, I don't want to write an academic paper. Uh, instead, I want to do something I have not done in my career until now, which is to write a book uh, on the superficialization of society. One of the chapters of the book would be related to what I will present you on the next slides. Uh, I'm inclined to do that. Uh, writing a book because it provides more leeway to express ideas. Uh, so the, the demonstrations uh, I need to develop in order to sustain an argument through a book chapter provide more opportunities for an author to deviate from 
the standards of rigor or whatever we call them. Uh, so, and it also allows me to engage with a different type of audience. Uh, so we will see how it goes. First of all, I would have to find the time to write the book, but the, the planning is quite set in my mind. I know what will be the basic chapters. One of them will be on COVID-19, but uh, the other chapters are decided as well. So we will see. Uh, OK, so aiming for plausibility. Uh, and I want to do that through a book chapter. Other orientations. Uh, shortly after COVID, it did not take months. It took weeks or maybe days. Uh, some academic journals uh, were clearly favoring the swift production of essays and short pieces on COVID-19. OK, that perhaps this is something which should be done. But when I was looking at that, I was to some extent skeptical of those uh, essays produced with, within a very short time. Uh, I was thinking, would it not be more appropriate to refrain from engaging in uh, a short-term reaction. So my rationale is that the passage of time may be necessary to build up a greater sense of perspective on a contemporary event. And indeed, this is what happened to me. Uh, so basically, you will see that my main instrument in order to uh, develop this potential book chapter uh, is me, uh, my own reflexivity. Uh, honestly, at the beginning of COVID, I was in a state of panic. Uh, I did not, well, my brain was not functioning properly. Uh, I was then uh, watching the press conference of the Quebec government, and I was not in a skeptical mindset at all. Uh, but this changed over time, fortunately. Uh, so after a few months, okay, I was able to get back to a more to more proper thinking. Uh, so so basically, this is the viewpoint I have. This is an important methodological point. Uh, so some time may be quite useful to take this stance from an event that occurs in action. Uh, Bertrand Russell, I really like uh, this sentence of him. Uh, there's in the world too much readiness for action without adequate previous reflection. So in other words, we should be careful to engage in uh, premature thinking and premature action. OK, as mentioned before, I rely on self-reflexivity. I am the main uh, instrument that will that I will rely on in order to develop this book chapter. I view this endeavor of mind as being quite consistent with uh, what Flubjörg uh, wrote in 2001 in a very nice book uh, regarding phonetic thinking. Uh, so I think my endeavor fits relatively well uh, what Flubjörg had in mind. Uh, on page 60 of the book, uh, he describes basic questions that sustain phonetic investigations. Where are we going? 
is this desirable? What should be done? Who gains and who loses by which mechanisms of power? Honestly, these questions were indirectly, I would say, in my mind when I was developing these slides and when I was trying in action to make sense of COVID. Okay, now the imposters syndrome. Uh, so who am I to engage in an analysis of policy making regarding healthcare? Okay, I'm a chartered accountant. Uh, I'm an accounting academic, so what do I know about these things? Uh, so again, Flubjörg uh, is able to provide some legitimacy uh, to my endeavor. Uh, so what what should be expected of phronetic thinkers is attempts from them to develop their partial answers as input to the ongoing social dialogue about the problems and risks we face and how things may be done differently. Okay, so I, the next slides describe my investigation journey. Uh, I don't have time to go through that, but it was a personal process as someone submitted to COVID, the COVID disease and COVID discourse. So different discourses on COVID. Uh, I read the, the, the daily newspaper as read is Le Devoir, uh, which is, I would say the most, uh reflexive newspaper in Quebec. Uh, I think I would compare it to the Guardian in the UK. Uh, so many source this was a key source of information, as well as French uh, CBC, French Radio Canada, uh, which uh, I also follow almost daily. Uh, discussions with my wife, uh, who has a PhD in sociology, as we were trying to make sense of COVID-19 dynamics. Uh, so gradually, uh, I became convinced that the could be something nice to say about examining COVID from the viewpoint of reproduction of status quo surrounding neoliberalism. Um, okay. Book development project, that's okay. Okay, so that's fine. Uh, I think all of the material I use has been originally produced in French. Uh, and in order to uh, develop translations, uh, I have relied on uh, this application, web application, which honestly, this is almost, well, no, this is a miracle. Uh, I'm happy to have lived not long enough to see this in action. Uh, it's basically, well, basically the, the accuracy of trend, those translations in my mind is about 95% uh, from French to English, English to French. I don't know about the other languages, but it works amazingly well. So this is what I did. Uh, so what you will see on my slides are the, the, the translations, which I have modified to some extent, uh, which were made through this web application. Okay, the emphasis will be on the press, on a few public reports. Uh, I view the press as a reflection of how people think. And the press also influences how people think. So relying on press articles to examine the endurance of neoliberalism makes sense. Okay, and I'm not the first one to do this kind of examination anyway. Uh, 
Okay, now the empirical analysis. Uh, okay, I realize that I don't have the time on my computer, so I have no idea how I, I'm doing. So, Sarah, could you tell me what time it is? It's just going to 20 to 2. So, if we go with the original plan, you've got about 20 minutes to okay. go. Okay, that's fine. This is fine. Okay, so here's the empirical examination. So I will go back to the outline just to show you what I have in mind. So I articulate my empirical analysis through four, let's call them uh, vignettes uh, or areas. Okay, so first theme, four themes. I will highlight four themes. The first theme, relates to vaccine development. Okay, this highlights a growing dependence on the private sector. Second theme, supply of personal protective equipment. Okay, so this relates to uh, the resilience of global neoliberalism. Then third theme, the first wave of numerous deaths we have in Quebec in long-term care facilities. Uh, what happened here is just the catastrophe. Uh, it was horrendous. Uh, okay, so the longer-term impact of that. And finally, uh, last thing, ephemerality from COVID-19 to inflation concerns. Okay, so uh, I will see how time goes. Um, I may not have enough time to go through these four themes, but we will see. Okay, so let's go to the first theme, the first empirical theme, which relates to a growing dependence on private sector regarding vaccine development. So here's an article from Le Devoir, published in April 2022, so it's relatively recent, that announced the construction of a vaccine production plant in Montreal. This is a significant news because as a result of global neoliberalism, uh, how could I say that? 30 years ago, there were production plants of vaccines in Canada, including in Quebec. Uh, as a result of global neoliberalism, these plants have moved outside of Canada to other places. Uh, a number of people realized during the COVID-19 crisis that this was a kind of mistake uh, because when we tried to obtain vaccines against COVID, uh, when Canada tried to obtain vaccines, we were not on the top of the list. People from the US, uh, they obtained vaccines first because there were vaccine plants, vaccine production plants in the US. Uh, so this was a big news, okay? The, the first announcement that Moderna will establish a vaccine production plant in Montreal. Okay, so we have here a picture of the Premier of Quebec and Prime Minister of Canada, uh, who were very proud to uh, announce it. Uh, here, what's written here, nous investissons en science et en recherche. We invest in science and in research. We invest, so the verb is very important. It reflects an economic mindset. They could have said something else. Uh, they decided to emphasize the economics of the matter. Okay, and the Premier of Quebec was very proud to have uh, that Quebec obtain uh, the approval of Moderna to build its plant here instead of Ontario. Uh, so for the Premier of Quebec, it was a great news because of that. Okay, so Quebec won the battle for the Moderna plant. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, what did he say? 
um, he argued that the arrival of Moderna will create hundreds of good jobs. Okay, so I argue that these, these sentences, these statements are consistent with short-term thinking, not long-term thinking. Still in the same article, okay, Moderna says it hopes to build bridges with Canadian university research, researchers. Build bridges, what, what is this? Uh, Moderna would make its technologies, the result of significant investment, available to them. Okay, so no questions are raised in the article about Moderna's business model. Arguably, uh, this uh, reflects a tendency to accept claims made by apparently credible institutions. So the journalist did not raise any question regarding this business model, which is really strange, by the way. And we will see that in another article. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, this other article, two months after the news that Moderna will establish a plant in Montreal. So in the same newspaper, Le Devoir, uh, a more substantive article was developed regarding trends in vaccine development. This is the beginning of the article. There was a nice question raised at the beginning. Okay, so the potential is immense, but it raises fears of the concentration of power in the hands of a few giants like Apple, Microsoft, or Google. So basically, if we tie ourselves too closely to Moderna and Pfizer, then what we'll do in terms of managing healthcare will depend a lot on the private sector. Is this something we want? Uh, so this is a nice point, but unfortunately, this is the only sentence on this article, which has about 1500 words, where this questioning is raised. So it, I argue that this reflects a tendency to focus on uh, means without questioning ends. Okay, still in this article, so researchers are enthusiastic about the new opportunities that are emerging for their work. They see a small revolution in medicine in light of what Moderna wants to do regarding its business model. Okay, so this is in line again with a tendency to think narrowly and technically. So the uh, enthusiasm regarding in the world of medicine, regarding uh, what the, the business model of Moderna. Okay, more substance here. In concrete terms, this means that the academics will be able to send the genetic code of a therapy they are developing to Moderna, which will send them back vials of their experimental serum. So basically, Moderna will become an indispensable passage point for the research on vaccines uh, taking place in the domain of medicine. Uh, this is quite disconcerting, <laughs> I would say. Uh, so so the, it's as if the formidable benefits offered by those platforms from Moderna more than offset any concerns about the extent to which this new paradigm of medicine research creates a situation of heavy dependence on a private sector company. So basically, most of the research will depend on 
a private sector company, Modern, who, which is going to provide the, the material necessary for those experimentations. Okay, so Modern's business model revolves around the outsourcing of research and development that the platform allows. Okay, some comments on it. Uh, why are there no more doubts in this article about the heavy dependence of Medicine Academia on Moderna? Why is there relative silence vis-a-vis -vis the role of the private sector over vaccine development? Is it acceptable to see private companies like Moderna making huge profits from a public good such as people's health? Uh, the above questions are consistent with a tendency. Uh, so well, my, well, I should improve my sentence here, but these points, uh, I would argue, are quite silenced in the articles. Uh, and therefore, they reflect a tendency not to get to the bottom of things. Okay, so this was the first theme I wanted to highlight. The second one, supply of personal productive equipment. Okay, May 12th, uh, Le Devoir published an article which highlighted a key conclusion in a report issued by the Office of the Auditor General of Quebec, which underlined that the Quebec government overpaid about $1 billion for personal protective equipment, especially during the first phase of the pandemic. So $1 billion from the viewpoint of Quebec, which is an 8 million nation, it's relatively, this is a very significant amount. Arguably. Okay, so we have here an excerpt from the article. So the health ministry finally began massive protective protection equipment purchases on March 22, 2020, 11 days after the World Health Organization declared a state of health emergency. So the tone of the article is quite factual. Okay, yet the root causes are not questioned and not emphasized in the article. One of these root causes would be the spread of global neoliberalism, the tendency to move production to low cost countries. This may be a nice way of doing from the viewpoint of the international corporations that do that. But from the viewpoint of a country, of a nation, then it could become a, a, a horror if a pandemic takes place. And everybody on earth wants to get access to the same equipment. So I argue that this Silence basically reflect a tendency to think narrowly and technically. In the same article, okay, so the department did not conduct its first equipment inventory until March 6, 2020, even though the World Health Organization Director General had reported in early February that demand was 100 times higher than usual. But it seems that someone or a department, the department slept uh, before deciding to act basically too late. Uh, the, the Auditor General revealed archaic methods each establishment had to manually enter its data. So every, most of the, the inventory processes were manual. Uh, so there was no computerization. So one of the chief, chief conclusions of the Auditor General relates to the decrepit state of the inventory management system, which may, we may view as a consequence of neoliberal orthodoxy in managing the public sector. Because there were, uh, over time, 
à Québec reduced uh, the budget given to health. Um, in line with neoliberal thinking. Uh, yet we don't see any inclination for root cause analysis uh, in terms of the Auditor General. What we see instead is a focus on technical planning. So thinking narrowly. Okay. Uh, Okay, and then there was a write down of equipment of about $1 billion. Uh, if I look at what the Auditor General says in her report specifically, so the recommendations she makes to the Ministry of Health are quite technical, quite consistent with uh, thinking that planning is important and so establish, maintain an up-to-date contingency plan, identify session commodities, etc. So all this is consistent with planning and it does not engage in root cause analysis. Okay, so one of the main silences in Article 3 uh, which I have just showed you, is the loss of sovereignty over the supply of personal protective equipment. This is one important silence. I argue that it reflects a tendency to focus on means without questioning ends, tendency to think narrowly and technically. One disconcerting observation is that two months earlier, well, two more, two months before the publication of Article 3, uh, an article from Radio Canada revealed factual information, preoccupations from various analysts regarding Quebec's high dependency on global markets. So the good point about that is that journalists are able from time to time to produce, to engage in deep level analysis. But somehow there was no connection made between the first article published two months earlier that raised nice questions and uh, the article two months afterwards that referred to the Auditor General's uh, work. So I argue that this points to ephemerality. Okay, so let me skip this. Uh, Okay, let's deal now with uh, numerous deaths. So the first wave of numerous deaths in long-term care facilities. Okay, so I cannot talk about the deployment of the, the spread of COVID-19 in Quebec without talking about this. Uh, first of all, what does neo neoliberalism think about the elderly? Okay, so I rely here, here on uh, David Harvey in a nice history of neoliberalism. Uh, he says, for capitalists, individuals are a mere factor of production. Workers are hired on contract, contract and in the neoliberal scheme of things, short-term contracts are preferred to maximize flexibility. Neoliberalization seeks to strip away the protective coverings that embedded liberalism allowed and occasionally nurtured. A personal responsibility system is substituted for social protections, including healthcare, that were formerly an obligation of employers and the state. In other words, if I understand David Harvey's point correctly, once an individual is no longer useful to the economy, well, this person is put at the periphery of society. Uh, this is what happened in Quebec through the creation of uh, healthcare facilities for elders. 
Okay, various newspaper analysis speak out against the state of the residential care system for the elderly in Quebec and how the COVID-19 pandemic was managed within those facilities. What happened in CHSLD, so this is how we call these long-term residential care centers here, is often brought to the fore in these analysis. So let us look at this editorial. So this is an editorial from Le Devoir. Uh, the heavy bureaucracy of the health network. Uh, this is published one year after the beginning of COVID. Heavy, so heavy bureaucracy at the Ministry of Health could not even provide the minister with a count of absent employees. Uh, the military, the Red Cross medical specialists were called in to help in these CHSLDs. The strategy, so, at, so what occurred at the beginning of COVID, uh, basically, uh, what the government decided to do is to create lots of empty space in hospitals because there were lots of elders in hospitals at the time waiting to get a transfer to CHSLDs. But uh, they were, so they wanted to create space for people who, be, become, who, be, who, who would become sick of COVID in hospitals. So they transferred 7,000 people, elders, uh, in CHSLDs, all of a sudden. So these 7,000 people were transferred at the beginning of COVID. Uh, they, were, they, they did not necessarily had COVID. A few of them possibly had, uh, but they were transferred. Uh, but the problem is, is that in, that, in these CHSLDs, uh, there were many deficiencies in the ways in which care is provided before COVID and during COVID. Uh, so in the end, Quebec had the worst record in Canada for the number of deaths due to COVID-19. Uh, so coronavirus caused at that time, one year after COVID, 10,000 deaths in Quebec as compared to 7,000 in Ontario. And the problem is that in Ontario, there are more people than in Quebec. So the journalist here says that as a proportion of the population, Quebec experienced 2.5 times more deaths than its neighboring, neighboring province. Okay, so... This editorial, I would argue, is indicative of reflective thinking. Uh, we see the editor seeking to think holistically, mobilizing at once different aspects of the problem. His editorial implies skepticisms regarding claims, reassuring statements made by a number of editor of institutions. Uh, inclination to persevere in questioning as the text takes stock of data and previous questions, being able to provide comparative figures that are quite persuasive in problematizing a situation. However, uh, the detail could go further in root cause analysis. Uh, this, the, the editor is silent on neoliberalism, new public management, or the lack of sufficient resources developed, de devoted to healthcare and the budget of healthcare. Uh, so there is an indication of superficiality in this respect. Okay, we have here another individual editorial, more recent, that reflects on those deaths. Uh, it follows the release of a coroner's investigation report into the deaths of the elderly vulnerable persons in the first wave of COVID-19. So the analysis is indicative of reflexive indi inclination. Okay, so examining the coroner's conclusion while elaborating a summary of the main facts that emerged. But the editor, the editor keeps silence on the role of neo, neoliberalism, new public management as well. Uh, so here's an excerpt. 
uh, I will just highlight the last sentence here. Uh, so it's factual, according to the coroner's report. Uh, desertion of caregiving staff during COVID, the lack of protective equipment during COVID, major gaps in the communication chain, the absence of clear orders, the closing of doors to caregiver, caregivers. It was a, a, a catastrophe. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a problem in that uh, in many residences, people were not in single rooms. The elders were not in single rooms. They were in in multiple rooms. So three or four people sharing the same room. Uh, once we knew that COVID spreads through air, so then it's not a surprise to see that there were so many deaths in CHS at least because uh, the ways in which the setting was configured. Okay, and one of the coroner's point is this one. The government of Quebec shall ensure that residential facilities can offer single rooms to residents. Okay, and this was highlighted in May 17, 2022. Okay, so May, May 2022, this key recommendation is made. And then what occurred right in the middle of this summer? Uh, in a Radio Canada article, uh, the article revealed that the Ministry of Health in Quebec decided to authorize, after a temporary stop, that three or four elders could be placed in a single room. Uh, when I heard that, I was astonished. Okay, so this is an excerpt from the Radio Canada article. So the change was made on July 2, so right in the middle of summer here, in a letter sent to the heads of Quebec's healthcare institution, a copy of which was obtained by Radio Canada. So basically the government did not make a big announcement of that. They made the decision and uh, they made it covertly. Okay, their argument is that there are too many people waiting to get a place, a bed in one of these long-term uh, care facilities. Uh, so there is too much demand, so they need to do something. Uh, but they do it in a way that reproduces one of the key condition of possibility that allowed COVID to be so deadly in Quebec. Okay, so this is what I just said here, which is expressed through the journalist. Uh, the, this article from Radio Canada is a good one. Uh, there's reflexivity in it. Uh, the journalist uh, interviewed the president of the Council for the Protection of the Sick. Uh, he interviewed uh, an infection specialist. Uh, and these people say that this move does not make any sense given the recent coroner's report. Uh, he and they interviewed as well uh, one politician here from the opposition, uh, etc. Okay, so what could have, what? Yves? Well, uh, we, yes, yes, Sarah, what I'll, time is it? I'll just take this opportunity to let you know it's seven minutes past two. Oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, well, briefly, uh, I think what happened uh, in the last six months or so is that Increasingly, uh, COVID concerns are less present in the press. 
and inflation played a key role in that. Uh, I think the interest of the press, of journalists, of readers is limited and quite ephemeral. Uh, and quite suddenly, uh, people and journalists begin to be concerned with inflation. Uh, so I would argue that this indication of ephemerality uh, is part of the process as well of, in, of uh, enduring uh, neoliberalism. So what I did, I went on uh, Factiva, you might know this database, uh, where I asked in the Globe and Mail, so the Le Devoir La Presse are not really part of Factiva, so I asked, in, uh, I made a free text search in the Globe and Mail uh, using two words, COVID-19, one graph, and inflation, one graph. So how many articles from the Globe and Mail are mentioning the word COVID-19 in the month of X, Y, Z? Okay, and this is the outcome. Uh, so in the last 12 months, until the end of September, so you see that there were basically 1,000 article around September 2021 that mentioned the word COVID-19. And oh, there's a pretty significant change here around February and March, basically. Uh, okay, and this relates quite well to the word inflation in the last 12 months, uh, where in September 2021, inflation was mentioned less than 200 in less than in less than 200 articles, and in the last four, six, four to five months, it was mentioned about 500 times. So it is as if uh, COVID became a less interest, less interesting news, uh, and journalists instead, or newspapers instead, decided to focus on a more something more interesting to them, uh, which is inflation. Okay, so just to recapitulate, uh, so two questions were at the core of my journey. So first question, to what extent has the COVID-19 crisis had a significant impact on the overarching influence of neoliberalism in policymaking? Uh, the nature of the text I mobilized points to endurance. So the private sector industry uh, becomes more and more influential as a result of COVID. So this is in line with neoliberalism extending its spread. Uh, at the end of data collection, Quebec was still highly dependent on foreign markets for equipment, medical equipment. Uh, key lessons from investigations, coroner's report regarding Quebec first, wave of deaths. They did not seem to endure. Uh, inflation became a much more important concern in the last six months, uh, thereby indicating that something is going on in terms of ephemerality, uh, in terms of ephemeral thinking. Second question. Uh, I advanced that super, well, I would argue that superficial thought has played an instrumental role in the reproduction of neoliberal thinking. Uh, I found that in various indications of superficial thinking in the newspaper articles I analyzed, all this, yet, there's some room for optimism uh, or not being too much pessimistic, as I found indications of reflexive thinking to some extent. Um, but it seems that ephemerality, uh, especially, impacts the 
impacts the people, well, the collectives and peoples tend to be quite ephemeral beings. Uh, they tend to focus on what happens currently. Uh, so inflation became dominant. As a result of that, we talk less and less about COVID. Uh, OK, so this is a very tentative set of, let me stop this. Uh, this is a very tentative set of slides. Uh, I will see how it goes if I find the time to write this. Uh, it, there will be changes, because when I write a paper uh, or an essay, I tend to change the argument along the writing. So we will see how it goes. But I think I have something interesting to say in terms of the endurance of neoliberalism uh, in a context that should have resulted in uh, deep thinking. Um, but unfortunately, well, the indications I found uh, through the press articles I analyzed that superficial thinking tends to be quite dominant. Okay, so let me stop here, 9.15. So we, we still have some time for questions and answer. Thank you. I, didn't, yes. I did not check the discussion, uh, the chat room. Uh, yes, we, we do have a few questions in, in the chat box, Eves. Um, so I'll, I'll jump straight to them, and then I, I will also open up open up to the to the audience as well, in case somebody wants to use their microphone to pose a question. Um, so there's a, yeah, two or three questions in the chat box. The first one is from Liu. Um, so it says, hi, Professor Gendron, from your presentation, you mentioned that superficialization during the COVID-19 pandemic causes a dependency on the private sector, for example, Moderna, for vaccine development. But isn't this dependency has been occurring in many industries during good or bad times for a long time? That is basically the economic system had created dependency on large multinational companies to provide good and services to boost the economy. For example, Exxon Mobil in, in oil and gas and the Nestle in the food and beverage industry, Ford in the automobile industry, et cetera. So the question is, what is so unique of this phenomenon during the COVID-19 pandemic? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, I will tentatively answer by uh, raising the point that uh, the COVID-19 dynamics is characterized by its magnitude in terms of impacting people's health. Uh, it was a matter of living and dying uh, to a great extent. Uh, so if, well, this is the kind of crisis which is so significant in terms of our lives, that this should, well, if there's a crisis that should have translated into uh, lots, lots of concerns, uh, enduring concerns, enduring questioning, perseverance in asking for significant reforms, well, this is the COVID-19. Uh, so I would argue that this is what makes this case unique. Uh, the other points you raise are very, very relevant. Uh, we have become, as a result of neoliberalism, we have become more and more dependent on the private sector. Uh, but to see that it was the case before COVID in medicine regarding vaccine development, for instance, and that Nothing seems to change significantly in this respect. Uh, in the aftermath of COVID is a point of frustration, concern, worry, et cetera. And I think it will be interesting to see, um, because for me, it feels quite fresh still, the COVID. We now talk, the discourse has slightly changed now. We're now calling it post-COVID time that we're in now. Of course, COVID is still here. Um, but it would be interesting to see how things remain or change 
in the coming few years, in year two, year three, year four, um, you know, after COVID as well. Liu, do you want to respond to that at all? Uh, no, actually, I, uh, I, I understand what Prof uh, Professor Gendron explained, yeah. Uh, uh, I have no other questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, yeah. re re reflecting on it, well, the passage, as, as I mentioned, the passage of time uh, will be quite useful for us to deploy our analytical lenses on COVID-19. Maybe it's still too soon uh, to carry out uh, in-depth analysis. Uh, maybe we need to be 10 years beyond uh, now uh, to be able to look at it. Uh, so we, from this perspective, looking now at the global financial crisis, which occurred in 2007 and 2008, well, this may be the proper time after 12 years. So we have now, I think, a pretty good understanding of what happened afterwards. Uh, so, we, so we will see, but yeah. But what? Well, anyway, we. I felt. Come. How could I say that? I felt enough confidence as of 2022 to develop these slides. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lou. Thank. Thanks, Eves. Okay. On to the next questions in the chat box. Um, the next questions, uh, question two and three, they're kind of linked together. So the first is from Neil, Neil Dunn, and the second is from Anne Stafford. Um, so I hope they don't mind that I pose both at the same time because they seem to relate to journalism. So Neil's question is, given that newspapers have space constraints, tight deadlines and a general audience, I wonder, are we expecting too much for them to transcend unquestioning superficial reporting of events? In other words, is this a story about journalism as much as it is about superficiality or neoliberalism? And if I may, Anne's question kind of draws from that. Um, is this perhaps also a story about changing trends in journalism over time? From a time when there were used to be big opinion pieces, which were indeed reflexive from established journalists, to now a time where journalism as a profession is now very different, having to adopt superficiality as a mechanism for survival in the face of the fast-moving social media. So over to you, Eves. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for these points. As a matter of fact, I had this these concerns in mind uh, when developing the slides and when looking at them yesterday night as well. Uh, uh, honestly, these points are very good and I would need to, when writing the book chapter, I would need to deal with uh, these kinds of concerns. Uh, now, the question is, well, I could probably frame my analysis in terms of the media, be, uh, highlighting deficiencies in the media, uh, pointing to developments in the media that occurred over time where I think they tend to be more and more descriptive and less and less reflexive. Uh, uh, but basically, I agree with these two questions. Uh, I will need to think about what I should do with it. Uh, so should it be a key part of my story or should it be somewhat part of my story, recognizing this, but keeping the focus on how they made sense of COVID-19. I think, I think my theoretical perspective makes sense to some extent, uh, that what people read currently in the media may impact, may have an impact on their thinking, on their, on their ways of thinking, their ways of making sense of the world. Uh, but I recognize that there is something going on in the media as well. So how is it that the media now report this way? Hmm. 
you know, and just the edit, the, 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 I would argue that the, the editorials, though, uh, are quite different from the regular articles. Uh, so the ones I have read deeply uh, indicate deeper reflexivity. Uh, yeah. yeah, then go ahead and, and please. Yeah, th thank you, Eve. I'm really enjoying uh, this discussion. Um, I think it's a, a very important and helpful discussion uh, to, to be having. I would certainly agree with you that editorials um, uh, are one way in which you would expect to see more reflexivity because it's a, an opportunity for opinions to be given. I was trying to think about, well, you know, if in the UK, which is obviously my field of experience uh, rather than uh, uh, your Quebec experience, where would I expect to see um, this sort of um, piece in relation to um, UK journalism? You obviously mentioned The Guardian at the start, and um, I was sort of thinking, well, in the past, people like George Monbiot in the UK have offered opinion pieces, um, which are, are much more reflexive. And But the, the numbers of journalists offering this sort of re reflexive piece seem to be less than perhaps in the, the heyday of newspapers. Um, and then I was also thinking, well, if it's not in newspapers, where else might I expect to see um, this opportunity to hold policymakers to account, which we might argue is one reason you know, an important reason for independent journalism. I guess that's introducing some new themes, perhaps, in terms of what is independent journalism um, and uh, what is the role of uh, uh, reflexive pieces. And I was thinking that probably in the UK, um, you would probably be looking at more specialist monthly magazines or something mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. that, rather than daily newspapers. Um, uh, I agree it, it's problematic trying to find um, sufficient reflexivity these days. And as I put in my question, you know, we've, we've, uh, social media, I think, plays a huge role in uh, uh, the way it has changed journalism and uh, uh, created this, this trend towards superficiality in order to keep up with everything as the uh, social media moves faster and faster and you you know one thing obviously that you need for relax reflexivity is time to reflect isn't it so, yeah uh, thank you thank you and this this yeah, this is a this is a very nice comment uh, the social media uh, they well if i were younger uh i think I would carry out the same kind of examination I did, but focusing on the social media in order to see how superficial thinking spreads in those media, um, how superficial thinking may sometimes meet reflective or substantive ideas, and what happens when the two of them clash together. Uh, so when there's a kind of uh, fight in the social media arena uh, between superficial thinking and more substantive thinking, uh, it would really be fascinating, especially since the younger, well, younger people increasingly rely on the social media in order to uh, get information and make sense of what's going on. Uh, so this is another point. So why why looking at conventional media, conventional newspapers, given that the number of readers of those newspapers decreases over time? Uh, this is another piece of criticism, which is valid. Uh, I would argue, though, that those articles, to some extent, are mentioned in the social media, media through Twitters and other means. Uh, but there is, a, there is a fundamental point. It is difficult to develop a reflexive argument on the social media where everything needs to be shot, basically. 
Euh, so sh shortness concision matters significantly. So how could you develop complexity of thought within just a few sentences? Uh, well, this is a worry to me. Okay, so thank you, Anne, for your comment. Thank you, Neil, for your comment as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. Neil, um, I don't want to move on without asking, do you have a response to that at all, Neil? No, it's all very interesting, and the hour so absolutely flew by, I have to say, with the presentation, so thank you so much, Eves. Um, I agree, if you're looking at newspapers, to partition or to kind of distinguish between um, news reporting and editorials. I think I, I I take the argument for social media. I think the risk with that is that you run down rabbit holes of kind of conspiracy thinking and the kind of echo chambers that are symptomatic of social media. So that has its own characteristics as well that could be equally problematic, you know, as, as traditional journalism. A third option that might kind of strike the balance between authority and freshness would be television programs. In Ireland, we have a program called Primetime which is on once or twice a week. And it's, you know, it's on the, the state television channel. And so it has that legitimacy, but it also has um, a kind of a look beyond the veil kind of critical aspect to it as well. It goes deep on news stories, basically. So that could kind of get the strike the balance of kind of relevance and rigor. Because I think social media and news print media have problems, I think, on that regard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank possibly, you. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. this is a good point. Thank you very much. Uh, I think in business schools as well have a role to play in this respect in that the future the future practitioners that go through business schools in undergrad studies at or in MBE pro programs. Uh, I think we should make them learn to get proper information to make sense of what's going on. Uh, so this may seem quite trivial, but I would argue it's quite fundamental. Uh, we should show our students the importance of having a reflexive mind and where they should cultivate this reflexivity uh, through the different readings they make every every day. Uh, and this reflexivity is unlikely to be uh, thriving on the social media. Uh, but that would be that would be my point. Uh, okay, thank you, thank you, Neil. That actually takes us quite nicely onto the next question in the chat box from Neural, uh, who's um She's further clarified the question in the last comment so in the chat box, so I'll read that out to you. Um, she was thinking that many crises are linked, if not produced, uh, by neoliberal forces. So what is our role as scholars? And I think you kind of partly answered that already, Eves, in terms of, you know, educating our students to think more reflexive, to challenge the norm, to ask the questions. Um, but do you have, you know, anything else to add to that, I'm sure? Well, I mentioned the, the book uh, from Bent Flubjörg, uh, Making Social Science Matter from 2001. Uh, this book provides uh, a very nice answer to this question. Um, the answer may be that as scholars, we should engage more and more in frenetic research, uh, having questions such as where do we go? Is this desirable? What could be done? Uh, who benefits from it? Who loses from it? Uh, in other words, academics may have a role to play in sustaining in engaging in conversations with people inside academia and also outside academia uh, with this kind of questioning. So this is why I think that writing a book uh, 
on the endurance, well, this book chapter, top chapter would be on the endurance of neoliberalism. Well, this could, well, who knows, maybe it will help to develop conversation outside of um, the usual readers of CAR articles and CPA articles. Um, this, well, basically this question makes us aware of the importance of thinking about where we publish our work. Should we only publish it in academic journals? Or should we try to engage as well with uh, people outside of academia? Absolutely, that, that's, a good, that's a good point, because if we are here to change society, uh, then we need to reach out to, to a broader audience, not just publish our work within the academic world. That is absolutely a very good point, to which I, I agree. Um, okay, I'll, I'll open it. I think that's it for the chat box for now. Th does anybody have any comments, any further questions they'd like to make over the microphone? I am conscious of the time. We are overrunning by a few minutes, um, but I'll just take this opportunity to check. Does anybody have any other comments or questions to make? Please unmute yourselves, make yourselves known, as they say. I'll jump in there, Sarah, if that's okay. Just one more thing that kind of struck my mind. Um, for me, the superficiality part is more interesting than the neoliberalism part. Um, there seems to be a kind of implicit assumption that neoliberalism shouldn't have survived COVID or shouldn't have endured. And if you take the counterfactual, I'm kind of thinking, well, why shouldn't it have, given that it's been, you know, around for a long kind of time, you know, at least 30, 40 years in this kind of current incarnation. So the, for me, the neoliberal piece was almost maybe obscuring the superficiality part. And just maybe to find a way to kind of make sure they don't conceptually blur as you proceed with writing it. But that would be mm -hmm. my kind of takeaway on it. Well thank, well, thank you very much for that, Neil. Uh, I, I agree with you. Well, basically, the intent is that the book will be on superficialization. Mm -hmm. So in the first uh, chapter, I will develop the notion of superficial, superficial, superficialization, what it means, uh, how it deploys, uh, how it's encouraged, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then in the other chapters, so each chapter will provide an illustration mm. of superficialization taking place in society. So one book chapter would be the one I presented today. Uh, I would like to have another one on Esvier, uh, which is uh, the, the ways in which the public, public companies uh, public, well, public companies uh, basically engage in the domain of academic publishing in ways which are basically detrimental to uh, mm -hmm. academia. Um, I would have to have a chapter on that and other instances. Uh, so through that, I hope that the focus on, super, on superficial, superficialization will be uh, more developed and obvious, but the first chapter will be on that. Um, so the reader will, the reader who enjoys uh, theorization should be more happy with that chapter. Uh, so thank you for the question. Thank you. Okay, so, thank you. So, I, so, so I think we are about done. I, know, I think we are. Yes, you, you must be exhausted by now. You yes, that's what, yeah, this is what I think. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you for everybody for, for attending, for your questions, your comments, and most of all, thank you to Eves for making the time uh, to give us this plenary this year. Fantastic. It was so fascinating. Thank you, Eves. I'm already looking forward to reading your book. <laughs> Well, first, first, I need to write it. Uh, and, thank, and thank you for listening to my verbal English. Uh, well, it's time we resume conferences because the, the language I speak since the beginning of COVID speaking is 
French. Uh, so I have less and less opportunities to speak English. So when I, when I have an event like this, uh, I listen to myself and I say, oh, I'm, it's time I, I, I begin again. I go back to conferences and I practice my English. Uh, so yeah. thank you for your patience. Well, it was it was it was very it was very good, and perhaps in future we can think of translations. You can present in French. Is I think Zoom might actually have a function. I've been told to translate. I don't know how good it is though, because I'm a Welsh speaker, so I, I can empathise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I would not be surprised that uh, this could happen in reality in two or three years from now. <laughs> Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Well, thank you again. Um, and just to remind everyone, because of the recording, I'll be stopping the recording and I'll be uploading it on the Ipsig's YouTube channel. So we have our own YouTube channel um, and I will send you all an email with a link to that if you want to go back and listen, listen again to today's session. So thanks again, everyone. Uh, wishing you all a good teaching semester for those of you who are teaching and barking on teaching in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, see you next time for our next IPSIG event. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Eves. Bye for now.